Good afternoon and welcome to the Yale Center for British Arts program, Artists in Conversation. I'm Linda Friedlander, Head of Education at the Center. Please note that this program will be recorded. Your camera and sound are muted and will remain so throughout the program. We will be using the Q&A feature on your navigation bar to gather your questions and we will attempt to answer them at the end of the program. But please feel free to submit questions anytime during the program. If you would like closed captioning, a live transcript is available by clicking on the icon on your toolbar. Yale University acknowledges that the indigenous people and nations, including Mohegan, Mashantucket Pequot, Western Pequot, Shattuck, Golden Hill Pawcasset, Niantic, and the Quinnipiac and other Algonquin speaking people have stewarded through generations the land and waterways of what is now the state of Connecticut. We honor and respect the enduring relationship that exists between these people and nations and this land. Ori Gersht was born in Israel in 1967. He has lived in London for more than 30 years. He received his BA in photography, film, and video from University of Westminster in London, and in 1995, received his master's in photography from the Royal College of Art. In his work, Gersh engages with the relationship between history, memory, and landscape. He often adopts a poetic metaphoric approach to explore the difficulties of visually representing conflict and violent events in histories. Gersh approaches this challenge, not simply through his choice of imagery, but by pushing the technical limitations of photography and film, questioning its claim to truth. His work has included an exploration of his own family's experience during the Holocaust, a series of post-conflict landscapes in Bosnia, and a celebrated trilogy of slow motion films in which traditional still lives explode on screen. Gersh's work has appeared in numerous international exhibitions, including an opening that Ori just came back from Germany a day ago, showing at the Getty Museum, the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, the Guggenheim, the Tel Aviv Museum of Contemporary Art, the National Gallery of London, the Yale Center for British Art, and the Victorian and Albert Museum. Gersh is professor of photography at the University of the Creative Arts in Kent. He lives and works in London. Ori? Hi, hello everyone. So in today's talk, I'm gonna focus on a particular aspect of my work and relate to um, a film that was shown recently online at Yale University in works that I presented at um, the British Art Center a few years ago. It's a film titled The Forest. And The Forest was filmed in 2005. I traveled to Ukraine together with uh, my wife. And my father-in-law survived the Holocaust in those areas. We went over there in an attempt to find some of the places that he was hiding in, uh, knowing that um, his mother was murdered in one of the forests around. And then I returned and made this film. And the idea behind this film was, so it started with uh, some sort of an urge to cut a tree, uh, as if a desire to leave some sort of mark in the landscape. And the film evolved from the, the camera in this film was is traveling through the forest. And it was very important for me that the camera movement will be um, will be indifferent. So there is no emotional attachment to the way the camera is scanning through the space. And this is an ancient forest. So kind of create an atmosphere or feel of an Arcadian space where the camera is traveling through. And constantly throughout these films, trees are falling. Now we're recording or 
collapsing for unknown reason. It's almost a sort of a pan, for, there is a paranormal aspect to this all in doing. And the sound for this film was recorded on location at different distances from the trees in an attempt to create or to establish a full sense of a landscape. So trees are constantly falling close and far away. The cameras are very close to the trees at all time. I wanted to have attention when the tree fall where the entire crew will feel physically through the body they experience and crying with the hopes that this will somehow transcend into into the film. In all the work that I'm, that I'm producing, there is never an attempt to create a, a direct political statement. It's much more of a poetic response to events. So in the process, I'm anyways detaching myself from the specificity of the event and try with all the good open up the experience into something that is um, um, is no beginning or end, something that is, is, is not attached or does not attach to a particular event or a particular time. The film is, uh, and, and, and the way I made this film, and I think many of my film, rather than thinking about a narrative, I'm thinking about a single image. And this image, I kind of keep, I'm re keep I'm returning time and again to the same image. It's much closer in many ways to poems and to prose. There is an elliptical kind of qualities to the way the whole film is structured and, and, and captured. So it's constantly a repetition and variation on the same, on the same image that together are creating a sort of a journey. I'm moving now to another film a very um, intimate film that I produced a couple of years earlier in 2003. This film was made in Las Vegas. I was traveling together with my wife in a camper van. And on the eve of the Iraq war, we arrived to Vegas and we parked outside of the, the street and we steamed the van with, um, with our kettles and then my wife scratched the Minotaur drawing onto the window. And I put a very simple camera in front of the window. And I, the camera was on autofocus. So the focus was shifting according to the plane that was in front of, um, in front of the land. So the first part of the film, the camera is focusing on the Minotaur that gradually evaporating and revealing the light of the, in the street, um, of the street. And as soon as the steam evaporate completely, the focus of the camera out of my control is shifting its position. And I'm showing this film here because one of the things that interested me is a sort of a, the window is a, is some sort of a barrier and the way the camera is responding to to the scene that is in front of the land. The camera is unable to make any differentiations and it's just a mechanical tool. And now this sort of divide between two spaces, two parallel events that are coexisting or concurrent. So it was a very peculiar kind of experience to arrive, you know, on the radio I hear about the, the eve of the war and all these things that are happening in the background and those celebrations that were happening on the street. So the film was, again, it was not, kind of a premeditated, it was just an immediate response. But this idea of a border, of a barrier, is an element that is that I keep coming back to and visiting in my work. And there could be all sorts of reason to this. I mean, originally I am from Israel, and of course I'm uh, coming from a, a, you know, a, a sort of a, a, an environment where um, dividing borders are playing a, a very significant role and constantly you know, on, on daily experience confronted with those sort of question of a, in defining territories and boundaries and rights, 
rights for land and so forth. So now I want to move to another film that uh, I produced in 2009. The Angelus Novus is an angel who looks as though he's moving away from something he's been fixedly contemplating. His eyes are staring. His mouth is open. His wings are spread. This is how one pictures the angel of history, his face turned towards the past, where we perceive a chain of events. He sees a single catastrophe, with wreckage piled upon wreckage and hurled in front of his feet. The angel would like to stay, awaken the dead, make whole what has been smashed. But a storm is blowing from paradise. It has been caught in his wings with such force that he is no longer able to close them. This storm irresistibly propels him into the future to which his back is turned while piles of debris before him grow skyward. This storm is what we call progress. This monologue is Walter Benjamin respond to a painting by Paul Clay, Angelus Novus, The Angel of History, as Walter Benjamin defined it. Um, Walter Benjamin bought this painting in Berlin and kept it with him throughout um, his life. And toward the, the end of his experience in Paris, when he was uh, desperate to cross the border and to uh, the United States, he attempted to sell this painting. He did not manage to he passed it on to George Bataille, which later passed it on to Odono. Later it came from Odono to Gershom Sholem, and now it's in part of the collection of the Israel Museum. The film Evaders was steaming out of this particular painting. And in 2009, I went to the lower Pyrenees between Banyols and Porto, between France and Spain, to the area where many Evades attempted to escape Vichy France or the Nazi occupation into Spain and then to um, Portugal and to United States. There was an American uh, diplomat, Varian Fry, who helped about 400 people to escape through these routes. Hannah Arendt was one of them. Benjamin was attempting, it's a very well-known story, to pass through this border and on the days that he arrived to the border, an order came from Franco to close the border. Allegedly, he was unable to take more of this, um, uh, this pain and burden and committed suicide. The next morning, the, the guards saw what happened, opened the, opened the borders, and the, the rest of the group managed to escape. When I made this film, and this is kind of a clear reference to the forest. So I was talking about this idea of barriers and a border. One thing that interests me is this kind of arbitrary nature of border in relation to it's some sort of geological times that they embedded in, in the lands and in, and in the rocks. And when I made this film in 2009, all the borders were deserted. So I arrived originally from Spain and cross the checkpoints. No one was sitting in the checkpoint between France and Spain. I was able to see on the checkpoint some uh, pictures of ETA terrorists from Basque country, but even this was not much of an interest any longer. And the peculiar thing was that on both sides of the border, um, the, the residents, the inhabitants were Catalans. So there was still a division for the Catalonian people between Spain and France, but there was not much, on, or I, I couldn't um, feel it when I was crossing the border. And 
when we were making the film, it was very much at the back of my mind that in 1940, of course, this border divided between life and death. And now jumping from that moment about 10 years later with the Brexit of United Kingdoms and with a nationalistic uprise again that I just came back from Germany and I was in the area of Weimar and I was told that in the villages around Weimar about 20% of the population were voting for the extreme right. We were talking about the uprise of neo-Nazis over there, of course, De La Pen. So we see all sorts of reactionary behaviors that coming as probably as fear of um, changes of the paradigm shift that we see toward glo- so it's kind of in a, a global world. But these borders are becoming once again very topical and relevant. And um, I think that this is true to the forest and to evaders. Just recently, when we had this conversation about showing the forest again at TL, the conversation came out of the war in Ukraine. And just before we uh, we start the screening, I read that um, Russian soldiers were grouping Ukrainian civilians and shooting them in the forest. The forest always is sort of a um, dialectical tension. On, on the one end, it's a um, sort of mythical place. And on the other, it's sort of backstage for, for atrocities happening on all sorts of levels from a, a personal crime to a um, crimes against humanity. And the same with evaders. When we faced the refugee crisis a few years ago, following the war in Syria and Calais was, um, Calais was stormed by refugees, all of a sudden I was thinking again about evaders and about the nature of border and how transient and temporary they are. There is something about those sort of relationship between, I think, my on biological temporality, this sort of idea that um, is a cultural tendency to impose upon the land. And as soon as things like this are done, there is a sense of um, permanency and eternity. Those borders are feeling so rigid. And at the same time, there is they're so ephemeral, almost redundant. When I filmed the Vedas, um, I was thinking about, and, and this is the reason why I presented it to screen, I was thinking about dialectical tension that are existing, existing in the, in, in the phrase or in the, in the paragraph, sorry, that Benjamin was writing about the angel of history. In the paragraph, he described an angel that is looking into the past and he sees wreckage upon wreckage. There is a wind that is keep blowing the wings of the angel and pushing him violently backward into the future and the angel would like to stop and come and resurrect what's been done but this wind is pushing him so violently and this wind is what we call progress and i thought about this sort of relationship that exists between the wind that is representing some sort of determinism or a materialistic view of history and then the messianic image of the angels that see all the, all the dead, all the past and want to come back and kind of make time collapse upon itself. And this tension that exists between the, the mystical sense of history, the messianic one, and the, the materialistic sense of history, I tried to kind of work through this idea in the film or in the presentation of the film. That's why I used the two screen. On the one end, there is a physical a experience of a man that is constantly walking through the landscape and the camera we were very close to him so he was walking in the dark it was very important for me to to work with him although he's an actor to work with him and to to strip all acting tendencies so before we started this journey i was um, discussing with him and explaining that it's going to be a physical endeavor that we're going to reach stages where we physically we may collapse and we'll film and we'll kind of explore these moments because we are not trying to reenact the journeys that Walter Benjamin took, but we are trying to create our own expedition. There are those parallel relationships between the uh, geographical relationship because we are trodding the same land and, and following the same route, but we are doing something that is original. It's happening in a different time. And we should not think about 
reenactment, but try to kind of go through an experience. So the physical side of the character walking through the landscape and it's happening in the dark on a very narrow uh, lane. He was unable to see apart from the spotlight of the camera as it was in front of the camera. Therefore, he had to follow the route. And the cameraman was walking backward and I'm hugging the cameraman and leading him through. So the three of us were interlocked. So this was one side. And the second side of the screen that you see here is the man in the snow. It's, I kind of thought about it more as in some sort of a metaphysical or um, immaterial experience where the figure is constantly dissolving, almost melting in the landscape. And the landscape and the journey is no particular time. So it's going through the different seasons, through different time. There is no linearity to it. It's almost sort of eternal. It's moving from the snow to the wind, to the rain, to um, uh, up the mountain and down the mountain. So the two coexisting throughout the film. Um, when I was saying, um, creating the photographs that went together with the images. It was very important for me to try to represent places that simultaneously exist and do not exist. Places that, are, um, that were recorded optically by, the, by a camera, by a lens that were in a particular place, and yet you can never find those places ever again. And the way I worked through the is I created sequences of images and I join them together into the panorama. But then in the process of joining them, I took a couple of images out and I find the perfect point to join the images again. So something is missing in those panoramas, but it's very difficult, almost impossible to decipher. However, if you go to those particular location, you'll never be able to find them because they do not really exist, although I photograph them. And this sort of space or the gaps that exist between a real place and an imagined one was um, leading me through when I was um, making these images. And this is also true to the forest in many ways. One of the things that interests me when we film the forest is how quickly the nature or the forest forgets. So the camera moves through the space and then a tree falls and it creates a gap. And very quickly, the branches and the leaves are closing those space and there is no memory. It's impossible to identify where the tree, where was the missing, where is the missing tree? And those sort of um, constant cycle of remembering and forgetting of something that's appearing and disappearing, places that, or oh, something that is very prominent and very quickly just dissolve, is in, I suppose, the motives that I keep exploring and revisiting. This photograph, titled If Not Now When, is from a series titled I Don't See. And it's a consequence of another journey that they took into swamps and marshes around the borders of Poland and Ukraine. And I follow paths that they um, was described in Primo Levi's book, if not now when, where he described or depict life of partisan, partisan communities that were attempting to establish some sort of a normality during the Second World War. And when I went to look at this, for these places, the back of my head, I was thinking about the impossibility because if people were hiding there, then no one knew where they were. And if no one knew where they were, it's possible that these places were not marked on any map. And if a place is not marked on a map, then there is a question if this place exists or do not exist. And I wanted to capture places. I wanted to create a series of photographs that are sort of hovering in the twilight between a real place and an imagined place. This photography is quite difficult because photography by nature is indexical and it's capturing, you cannot photograph something that is not there. Because photography, and I know that some people could argue that there is abstract photography, but I 
I don't think that it's, as soon as you move into pure abstraction, I don't think that it's any longer photographic because the photograph is always relying on light that is bouncing back from a physical object that is occupying the space. And this light is then going through the lens and being focused on either a sensor or film and register the information. So challenge here was to capture a place that exists and don't exist simultaneously. And what I try to do is to photograph these places or to go and photograph these places very early in the morning. I went in the month of November where it was very misty. So the water of above and the water of below somehow, the sky and the water are melting or dissolving one to another. And I tried to create a situation, photographic situations where the, the horizon is melting down. And then there is also the reflection. So there is tension between the physical and the virtual. And the space is no longer, you know, there is, viewer can no longer orientate himself in the space. But when you come to these photographs, they don't feel like two dimensional. The further there is a depth, in, but it's impossible to hold on because there is hardly any information in them. This is another photograph from this series. This is a long exposure, very long exposure during those misty conditions. So a lot of the information melting down and you kind of move into a space in photographs that is very close to abstraction, but still all holding its identity or the specificity of the place that the photograph was taken in. In 2016, I went to Kyoto and I did um, a series of a uh, body of works that I thought titled The Floating World. And this photograph titled Hanging Sky from a series of, uh, of images that I took around a lake that was created artificially to reflect the moon. And it's one of the oldest gardens in Kyoto, the outskirts of Kyoto. This photograph is turned upside down. I actually photographed it in such a way where the um, the so botanical plants that are emerging out of the water, but because they have a meeting point with the water and we, or, or the emerging out of the water, there is a perfect reflection. So you start to see um, a complete meltdown between the physical and the virtual world. And some of the shapes that are created here are almost perfect triangles, shapes that do not really exist in nature because of the perfect symmetries that they, that they are uh, proposing. And I was interested, I was talking earlier on about, or when I showed the previous photograph about the meltdown between the physical space and the sort of space that, or a space that exists and doesn't exist. And one thing that's really interesting me now, and I, my work since this period, since 2014 is growing more and more, is the relationship between the physical and the virtual. And I'm thinking about it because when I started photography, the conversation was always about images that are representing the world. And I think that we're going through a period now of transition where images are no longer representing the world, they're becoming the world, it's the, the, they are the world themselves. There is no longer a barrier, there is a complete meltdown between the physical and the virtual world. And in this series, and again, you know, I, I'm talking about these things and I'm trying to articulate very clear ideas, but the way I think about those explorations is a much more kind of a, poetic and, um, and inarticulate manner. Uh, there are images that are kind of emerging out of the experiences and later I reflect and I bring work to contextualize. This is another photograph from the series of Vader. Once again, it's a place that exists on the one end, but it does not exist on the other. I took photograph, this is a, it's on top of a mountain in the lower Pyrenees. I took an helicopter that dropped me there and I had a few hours to uh, walk in this area completely by, by my own. It's a space, it's a place that it's, um, um, you cannot stay for very long. It's birds and nesting there and the, the helicopter was not allowed even to land. We were able to drop me and then fly away. 
And this photograph were put together from a sequence of images. So I mapped this landscape and then we joined all the elements together. And when I made these photographs in the Lower Pyrenees and I go back to the journey of Walter Benjamin, I was thinking about an attempt to cross a border to escape. But actually, the escape is not from one country to another. The way I imagine it is the escape is from a certain cultural heritage that is really tying, I was thinking about Benjamin, but tying a person down. So, you know, often, and I think in the case of Benjamin, and I know that this was in the case of a, the writer Stefan Zweig, who managed to escape from Germany, from Austria to Brazil, and then committed suicide because his life were completely meaningless. So he couldn't, everything was groundless outside of the cultural context that he felt so deeply part of. And I was thinking about it in the process. I was trying to create, although I was filming this and taking those photographs in the lower Pyrenees, I was trying to imagine all the times that I'm in the Alps. And I was thinking about German romanticism. I was thinking about Caspar Friedrich. I mean, I just came back from Weimar, so Goethe, and you know, these sort of ideas that somebody like Benjamin is so deeply rooted in, and that's what stopped him from actually escaping or moving away incapable to separate himself from this cultural heritage. So the whole journey, the landscape, you're looking at the lower Pyrenees, but actually what you're seeing is the Alps. And I was trying, and in the film, I was um, kind of constantly returning to this, uh, in a second, to this, this idea that cultural heritage is pulling the figure back and the figure tried to move out of it, but it's very almost impossible because then, because it's so deeply rooted in a particular history, in sets of values and aesthetics that then it's almost impossible to get out. And that's why the, the consequences of the end is uh, so tragic. This photograph was created around the period where I made the forest and the mountain, it's a series of photographs that I titled Liquidation. And I mentioned earlier on that uh, my father-in-law survived the Holocaust in, um, in those areas of Ukraine. It's uh, West Ukraine, it's near Lavov, and it's uh, in a particular village um, named Kosovo. And when he was five years old at the time when the war started, and when the German arrived, they gathered all the Jewish people of the village and asked and ordered them or shouted them to go to the top of the mountain to organize them for work. And he was on his way up together with his mother where the German officer shouted them to go back because there were too many people already on top of the mountain. And that day, the Germans and Ukrainian collaborators, they prepared two pits on top of this I, mean, I call it a mountain, it's the hill really, on top of the hill, and they were shooting a lot of, uh, 2,000 Jewish people were shot, 50% of the population of the village that over two nights, and they were pushed into the pits and suffocating and dying, killing each other, bodies upon bodies. And they knew about what happened because there were a few people at the top of the pile that managed to crawl out and they came down and they told some of the survivor people that were not there, what had happened. And my father-in-law carried with him this trauma for the rest of his life, and he was talking about the mountain. And when we arrived there, we saw this place, which was, like I mentioned earlier on, it's, it's really it's just a hill. And I was thinking about the gaps that exist between a memory of a five-year-old and the physical experience in the space. And then about the problem that they have, with the camera, because the camera is a mechanical tool, will only capture what is in front of it, will capture this Bruegelesque landscape and with no sentiment and without psychologically conditioning itself to a place that I was in when I arrived to this place. So I decided to, uh, this was, 
I was using film, the analog film rather than digital uh, photography at the time. And I decided to try and expose the film for a very long period of time. I wanted the light that create and register information on the film to be also the force that erasing and destroying information. So I was imagining that light, you know, light, when you expose the film to light, it's register information. If you leave the aperture open, more information will be registered and more information will be registered. And it's layers upon layers of information coming upon each, each other. And in the process, they start to erase some of the information that is underneath. So it's become a process of recalling and erasing, recalling and erasing. And the final photograph or the final result is a black negative with no information whatsoever. Then I go to the dark room and I'm trying to save something. And these are the images that came out, which are, I saw them as some sort of fusion between absorbing and projecting. The camera is absorbing the landscape and my psychological condition is projecting on it. So the long exposure becoming a place of fusion of the two, of a sort of a meltdown. And then I get these images, which it's a direct photograph and it's a document of the mount, but it looks so remote from the actual mount. And then I show this photograph to my father-in-law and for him, it's a photograph. It's the closest image he's ever seen since he was five years old of this mountain. So this image is becoming his new, not just memory, but his experience of a place, a place that doesn't really exist. And these gaps that exist, and it goes back to what Linda mentioned at the beginning, the relationship between photography and truth, how we define truth, which we are always striving to, because if there is nothing that can be all eldest truth and everything become meaningless, how can we form a moral position and all sorts of questions that are coming that I always feel that photography is playing a major part in our, in such experiences. And hence the kind of the, the interest that they have in the virtual images that are becoming, or the kind of taking over physical or sensual experiences. This is the last thing. I know that we are coming very close to the end, so I'll uh, try to be uh, short now, but this is the, um, the last shot of the film that they did. And it's filmed from the Spanish border, Porto. And this shot is actually scanning the entire route. So you start to see the mountains where we arrive from. These are the back on the mountain. We cross from the back and cross the border. And it was almost a shot that is kind of a mapping and reflecting as if going outside of the character of the figure that was walking through the mountain and giving a sort of an overview of the, of the journey. I want to end up with another clip from a film that the thing I told you dance for me this is um, the protagonist in this film the woman that you see in front of you her name is Judith Anno and I met her in 2013 when I was um, having some conversation of interest with people that um, survived the concentration camp still have the number to want around. And it has to do with a childhood experience that I had, because I used to travel with my grandmother on the bus, and this was part of the landscape in Israel, and they disappeared, it would disappear, and I kind of became very much aware of the change in landscape. So, and out of interest, I start to meet some people and just conversation with them. And I came across Yudi, and we were talking, and it was a dancer and she was sent to Auschwitz in 1944 and the Germans tried to force her to dance for them in the Christmas party. This is the last year of the, of the war. She refused. She said to me that all the decisions and she said that this moment she realized the power to say no. The results 
the German punished the, the uh, force to stand barefooted in the snow for a long period of time. And um, then she made a vow that if she will survive this, she will dedicate her entire life to dance. And she did her record as well, she formed a dance school. It became later very successful, still existing. People that follow the, continue with the group. And when we met, I asked you, I said, you know, maybe we can make a film together. It will be like a portrait where you dance one more time. She was very old and frail at this point. She suffered from osteoporosis, so she couldn't physically dance, but she was able to dance in a chair. And the film starts with a rocking back and forth, and the camera is on a long dolly moving away from her. And then, and so the camera is on a long dolly, and she appears and disappears. And as we, as we kind of went through, the filming, I realized that she was not satisfied. I asked her why, and then she mentioned to me that she had this idea and she felt that um, I'm imposing. And uh, then I said to her, listen, Edith, let's do one more take where I'll pull back. You do whatever you do and the camera will just follow you. And it became the main sequence of the film where she's dancing predominantly with her head and the camera is, is following this sort of um, experience that she had appearing and disappearing between lightness and dark. Um, Ori? Yes? Ori? That was um, a rather, it's a short take. Could you just replay it, please, so that um, people have a chance to observe sure. her again? Sure. I mean, it's, the film is about 13 minutes. So I just have a short clip. I'll play a little bit longer from what I have here. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And so. I'm leaving you for 30 seconds while it's playing. Okay.
Lori, that yes. just takes my breath away. And I have to ask you, what about Theodore Adorno's conviction that to write poetry after Auschwitz is barbaric? And Damn. for me, that that dance performance became just transformational. Yeah, I mean, I think that a statement like this may be um, a statement that is coming very close to um, to a very tragic and traumatic chain of events. I think that um, without poetry and without art, um, our entire existence becomes almost pointless and meaningless. It's something that is so deeply needed in our in our psyche. So I don't think it's saying so yeah I don't that's my response to a gone state. Okay. May I go into a couple of questions now? I wonder if you could talk about how you see the relationship between film and photography. In some ways, your films seem like moving photographs. The frames tend to be fairly static. How do you think about the differences and how do you choose when to use a still versus video? Thanks for a great talk. Thank you. Um, so, you know, in all the films that I show, of course, there is some sort of narrative that is emerging and almost inevitable when you put images in linear sequences, but they're always stemming, as I said before, from a single image. And in this respect, they are very close to the photographic experiences, but there is a fundamental difference because the, the still photographs are lacking the temporality and the, it's very much, and when I use a still image, I'm very much thinking about the, you know, I mean, it's true to, to every film that in terms of the composition, every decision must be very precise, but it's a moment that is inescapable where the film is building the experience in time and sometimes the relationship between the two, and I often show them together in relation to each other, it's what gives, I think, a much more complete experience. So how do I choose? Um, it's, it's not always so rational. Uh, I perceive something as a film or a photograph. Um, and I think it come out of somewhat the, the, the intention. So then, yeah, I think that's... Okay. Is, we have a question uh, here from our, our chief curator, um, Martina Draw. I love how you describe the technical process and how this is such a central part of how the meaning of the work develops. Is that something you plan ahead of time or is it part of a spontaneous process of decisions you develop when you arrive at a place? Spontaneous, but um, it is arriving. It is a some sort of fusion with the circumstances, but also with, I assume, source and concern about Photography, the medium, its limitation. So it's coming out of my day to day practice. And that's where the process is kind of, um, I suppose, refining itself and it's being articulated uh, spontaneously when I have certain experiences. It's almost impossible to, to take those, you know, to premeditate those decisions because those events are spontaneous events. I don't know what I will see. I don't know what will happen even when I work in the studio. So often I do something and then I see, I reflect at what I'm looking at the material and then some decision will come. And so the choices and, you know, when I did the long exposure, there is of course a lot of uncertainty and, and uh, it charged the, the journey because I'm not sure if I'll get anything at the end of it. And part of it is the acceptance of the fact that I'm going through an experience and I'm, I'm experimenting open-endedly and maybe there won't be any outcome. And 
So yeah, it's a sort of a spontaneous response, but uh, I would say that it's uh, unpacking itself or oh, past experiences and, and thoughts and, and intuitions are just unpacking themselves. And, and so probably it's a combination of the two in some way. Who inspires you? Um, when I made the Vedas, and when I made the forest, I can definitely say that um, somebody like Werner Herzog was at the back of my mind. And, you know, this uh, film like Phil Steel Aldo, it's a film that I keep thinking about throughout my life, not every day, but very, very often. The absurd desire to go to the Amazon to build an opera. And then, and the process of making this, which was, um, you know, such a persevere physical experience and of course carrying with it this sort of German romantic uh, romantic spirit and all the kind of political tensions that uh, were falling in the process uh, inevitably when a European go to the Amazon and facing the native people and so there was something about this and when I made the forest, when I made the Vedas, it was uh, definitely at the back of my mind. I was uh, thinking about how to push the experience, the, the filming process to a point where it's, um, no one is thinking about, it's freeing everyone from many contrived thoughts that everyone is in a much more of a survival mode and they have to focus on what they're trying to do because it's in the forest we're 15 people filming and the Vedas also, it's relatively large, large team. Um, and with the film of you, it, you know, I would say that the people like Beckett, and even Camille, Albert Camille, somebody I think a lot, you know, the, the sort of a, existential soul figure and how to position itself, right? the figure in relay, you know, how much emotion is charged and how much it's kind of uh, stripped away from, I mean, the film with Judith is very emotional, but she's kind of, uh, but she take the stage and the role and, and I kind of felt that my duty is just to give her the, uh, give her the space to do this. It was quite um, actually, complicated situation because when I met her and when we talked about making this film, I told her that I'll come back in three months and she told me that three months is a long time. And I said, not really. I mean, you know, it would be quicker than you anticipate, but then I couldn't get hold of her and it took me six months to, to find her. And then when I did, I realized that actually she, she fell in the time between the time I met her and, and time that I could not get old of her, she fell and she banged herself on the head and she tried to get up by herself. She didn't realize she was unconscious and she had an internal bleeding, so she had to be hospitalized. She survived it, but she was suffering from some sort of uh, amnesia. She, she was in, in the cognitive uh, abilities were deteriorating, so we couldn't film and then I, talked to her husband and we met and she decided instead that she wants to do it, but there won't be any um, oral parts to it. It will just be the performance. And I went right away because I knew that to, you know, we just had to do it. We went in and, and we did the filming. And when the day I arrived, it was quite amazing because she was so much looking forward to that. And she really uh, made herself up and she really come, came to life that morning with makeup, with a focus, with everything uh, that uh, was ready for, as if, you know, the diva that is kind of uh, returning to the stage. And um, so the film was a reflection of that. And we, we were only able to film for a short period of time because physically it was deteriorating quite quickly. Thank you. We have one last time just for one last question. You use a lot of mountains. What meaning do they have for you? It's a, it's mountains and it's the desert and it's the sea. I just think that I, 
you know, I talked a little bit about the romantic spirit, but those places that then, you know, uh, you know, romantic fun, those places that I really feel my, um, my insignificant mortality, there is a, a places that I'm naturally attracted to. Actually, my favorite place on all is, is the desert, but I didn't show any desert film. Ori, thank you very, very much. You've been called a philosopher, a visual poet, and many other things in terms of people writing things in. And many thank yous for a very thoughtful presentation. Um, thank you very much. Right, thank you very much. And for those of you uh, in attendance, thank you for coming. Thank you.